Hello and welcome to Finextra TV. I'm Liam Zevier and you join us at Cybos 2025 in Frankfurt. With me right now is Sergei Nazarov, the co-founder at Chainlink. Love to see you, Sergei. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. How's your Cybos going so far? Very well. Lots of adoption. Fantastic. Now we're here to talk about blockchain and on-chain finance. How is traditional financial infrastructure being connected to blockchain and how is that impacting on-chain finance? So I think our work with Swift is pretty cutting edge, where we've shown how Swift messages can be used to trigger blockchain transactions, and how those blockchain transactions can then be fed back into Swift messages. Uh, we have a number of things on different data, uh, for market data from Deutsche Börse, to corporate actions, together with the DTCC, Euroclear, Swift, DBS, UBS, and others. So I, I think you're seeing a lot of different layers of the TradFi uh, kind of stack get integrated via Chainlink into the on-chain world, whether that's institutional data, whether that's identity with the LEI, whether that's uh, corporate actions, whether that's uh, even just basic messages and functionality that existing systems have. So I think Chainlink is, is very far along in integrating these different layers of existing systems and making them highly useful on chain. And so what about standards? How are technical standards evolving to support tokenized assets and institutional fund management on chain? So Swift has now released some new standards this year that also have a blockchain component to them. Uh, that's partly from our collaboration with them and now you can define certain blockchain transaction aspects in ISO 22 Swift messages. So standards are very important because you know it, it, it's the efficient way for transactions to happen, and that efficiency means there's more participants, more transactions, more users. So the thing that's that's really valuable here is that you have existing standards like Swift and ISO 20022 messages and the Swift keys, and then you have the new standards like Chainlink, which are the on-chain standard, right? And, and Swift is very good at integrating with the existing user base, and then Chainlink is very good at integrating into the chains and all the different uh, systems on chain, like the different contracts. Now we've made those two standards compatible so that the Swift membership can utilize chains. And so the, the, the appearance of reliable standards on chain is I think one of the key building blocks that Chainlink provides to the whole blockchain ecosystem. Standards for how data works on chain, standards for cross-chain interoperability, standards for how identities represented on chain, standards for how Swift messages and other commands are executed on chain. All of that is actually um, really critical, I think, to the next stage of our industry here in the digital asset world for scaling purposes, right? If, if you don't have people on a shared way to transact, on a shared way to define data, on a shared way to define identity in this on-chain world, then everyone has to coordinate a lot every time they want to transact. But if you and me agree that, you know, we use the Chainlink ODP on-chain data protocol to define market pricing and to define valuation data, if we agree that we use CCID, the cross-chain identity, together with existing identity systems that get put on chain through that identity system, if we agree that we're connected to each other over CCIP, the cross-chain interoperability protocol, now all those questions of how do we prove the value of the asset, how do we prove the identity of the people transacting, how do we move the asset between my chain and your chain environment, all those questions went from a big cost to no cost. And so that's really the power of standards. And then you, you do need the existing standards, like the Swift messages, to be made compatible so that the big user base on the Swift standards can, can be able to use the new on-chain standards in the form of ODP, CCIP, CCID, all of these different chain link protocols and standards. I think you mentioned it briefly there, but I think before we used to think of decentralized technologies and finance is quite separate from regulation, but that's changing quite a bit. So how are decentralized technologies helping to support uh, regulatory, regulatory compliance and uh, identity verification in finance? Yeah, there's, there's definitely now uh, a world where on-chain compliance is something that's necessary for transactions between institutions and also between institutions and the DeFi protocols in the public chain world. That really starts at a certain level of identity. That's where we have CCID, the cross-chain identifier. 
The cross-chain identifier can include different uh, sources of off-chain identity, sources like the LEI, Swift identifiers, and others. And so you, you can create identity on-chain. Then, once you have identity, you can start automating compliance. You can start creating conditions around your identity has proven these five things to me, but these two things remain, and when you prove these seven things, then we can transact. And so you, you, you're now in a world where Chainlink has successfully, successfully put a lot of identity on chain, and you're, you're in a world where people are starting to automate their operations around that identity, and with that automation, you actually get a lot of efficiencies. And those efficiencies are really quite, quite valuable because the traditional compliance model and method of compliance and process of compliance is really costly, time consuming, takes weeks to months to onboard. In this new model, what we're really shooting for is that once you prove your identity, once you append various proofs about the status of your identity, you know, that you're an accredited investor, you're not on the OFAC sanctions list, you're in a specific jurisdiction, you're in good standing on some you know, other dimensions, then you can reuse that verification with other institutions. Yeah. So instead of having to go through 10 months of aggregate onboarding across five institutions, you're now at two months for the same five institutions. And then that, that, that scales massively if instead of 10 institutions, you have 100 institutions or 1,000 institutions utilizing that same uh, level of verification. So that's really the long-term vision. And the short-term value is enabling institutional transactions between institutions and between institutions and the public chain DeFi protocols. And you mentioned efficiencies there. How can AI and smart contracts be used to um, plug gaps in inefficiencies around corporate actions and also help to innovate digital asset um, areas? So what AI does in, in, in the financial industry right now is I think it takes a lot of unstructured data, a lot of confusing data, a lot of data that can't be used for automation, and it turns it into structured data, reliable data, data that can trigger things and trigger automation. So that's what we've done with corporate actions, where we use multiple AI models on a network of uh, nodes, and those nodes compare the results of the AI models. So you have multiple AI results getting compared and finalized, which reduces the amount of manual intervention in corporate actions. So I, I think the statistic is that about 75% of all corporate actions require manual intervention. They require a person to view the corporate action, read it, confirm that it's correct. We think that we can take that down to less than 5%. And so that's a huge reduction using AI to verify the data and do it in a, in a kind of consensus-driven recurring way. Then that data that gets verified by AI uh, in the Oracle network gets put on chain. That creates a golden record. So that creates a shared golden record that everyone that wants to rely on that corporate action can rely on. And then we connect that golden record from the chain where it's initially published onto all the other chains. So now it receives this wide distribution across all the chain environments where smart contracts will want to use it. And then what this really results in is that you have tokenized equity, you have tokenized stock that requires access to corporate actions in order to operate properly. And now you can operate it correctly on chain because both the tokenized equity and the corporate action are both on chain able to interact with each other, which is really the right way to build that, to build that system. So I think we're, we're entering an, an exciting world where you have a lot of critical information going on chain, you have a lot of chains getting connected to each other, you have a lot of liquidity going on chain, you have AI models creating uh, reliable data sources for um, the automation of various asset servicing activities like corporate actions, and I think that's all adding a lot of uh, value, end user value, to smart contracts, and what those smart contracts are able to do on chain for the financial institutions. And I think now we're going to reach that point where you have enough stable coins on chain and enough tokenized funds on chain and enough of these other, you know, better ways of doing asset servicing, better data, data methods on chain that don't exist off chain. And so now you'll have 24-7, 365 markets. You'll have those stable coins and those tokenized funds trading in those markets. You'll have 24-7, 365 collateral management. You'll have better corporate actions management. You'll have better data quality. All of these things, I think, are going to add up to a long list of, of benefits that make the digital asset version of something better than the TradFi version of it. And so that's something that I can see happening and, and going out into reality next year. Well, really interesting discussion. Uh, hopefully we can see a bit more next year and see where we're, where we're at then. 
Thanks for joining the studio. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.